So my name is Chris Nichols. I'm a soil microbiologist. So why am I creating a roadmap? Uh, it's weird for someone to want to do a roadmap, uh, especially a roadmap that uh, I'm going to create that's a roadmap that's above ground roadmap that we're going to talk about. Um, and the reason that I'm going to talk about an above ground roadmap as a soil microbiologist is because as a soil microbiologist, uh, for some of you who maybe heard me talk yesterday, as a soil microbiologist, I fell in love with the fungus when I was 19 years old, and I have yet to fall out of, a love, out of love of a fungus. Um, and this fungus, uh, as I was discussing with my wife yesterday uh, on the phone, um, and as I said yesterday in my presentation, there is the fungus, my wife, my dogs, the rest of my family, on the, the hierarchy of, of loves. And, 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 and so, you know, she was not happy with that. But um, <laughs> she knows where she ranks, as I said. You know, I explained the whole thing about um, in our marriage vows. The fungus was in our marriage vows, so she knows where she ranks. It literally was. I can show you the marriage vows. They're on, on my phone. I wrote our own marriage vows. Um, so uh, she knows where she ranks. Um, but the reason it is is because uh, although I have an advanced degree, uh, I had some of the best education in my life working with some farmers. I come from an agricultural background. I come from farming country in Minnesota. Um, but I had some of the best education in my life working with farmers in North Dakota. And this was about 15 years ago. And over that time, I have really come to get a better understanding, but also get a frustration in this idea that we are running out of time. And I think that that is something that we have heard a lot about at this conference in many ways, that we are running out of time. And so we need to develop a new roadmap on how we're going to be able to solve this issue, on how we're going to be able to really get on the map of getting regenerative agriculture. We need to change hundreds of millions of acres hundreds of millions of acres, in fact, billions of acres, tens of billions of acres globally, hundreds of millions of acres in the United States and tens of billions of acres globally. And we need to do this fast. So when you're trying to map out how to do a roadmap, what you need to do is you need to have a good starting point. And in your starting point, you need to figure out why you're starting there. You need to figure out who you're starting with and exactly where you are starting on the map. You need to have, in this map, we're going to have, instead of having various points along the road, we're going to have a lot of on-ramps. Because there's a lot of ways in which people can get on the road. So we're going to have a lot of on-ramps. And there's going to be a lot of obstacles as well. There's a lot of things that are causing a lot of difficulties on this roadmap. And then we've got to have a good destination. And so we're going to talk about sort of the start and the destination because I think that having both of those in mind to begin with is the beginning ways of how you're going to design a map. You have to have where you're going and where you started from before you know how to, how to get the path there, right? If you don't know where you're going and you don't know where you started from, how do you know how to get there? So the destination, I think what we all can agree on that we want is abundant, inexpensive, nutrient-dense, easily accessible food produced in an environmentally friend friendly, economically just manner, right? That's what we want. Doesn't sound so hard. <laughs> it's not that bad. We should be able to have that. Right? So, why do we want this? What's going on and why is this urgency now? As I said, for 15 years, for the last 15 years, 
since I was working with some of these incredible innovative farmers and was able to go around the country and around the world and talk and see a lot of the innovations that were going on, I still was feeling like I recently went back to North Dakota and I've been feeling like it still has been these isolated pockets of, of farmers. And they're doing incredible innovations and there's a lot of really good things that are going on. But again, we need to change hundreds of millions, tens of billions of acres. And so these isolated pockets are just not good enough. And the reason why is because this is what our continent looks like. Hot spots. The hot spots, the darker red that it is, is where we have soil degradation. The more degraded our soils are. In the middle of our country, where we grow most of not our food, because that's not where we grow food anymore. It's where we used to grow food. Now we grow, and I was recently in Iowa, and I told the farmers in Iowa, and I was in North Dakota, and I told the farmers in North Dakota, you grow low quality feed in an industrial product on some of the best land in the world. Why? You're letting that best land in the world go away. These highly degraded hot spots that we have that we're losing this land. And what we've done is we've focused, we're hemorrhaging soil. We're hemorrhaging some of the best resources that we have. This is why the most important resource that we have, every war that has ever been fought has been fought over food. At the core of what we have ever fought over has been food. You can argue about religious reasons, you can argue about a lot of other reasons, but at the core, it's always about food. Because food is a basic need for life. We're always fighting over who has access to food and how to get access to food. And we have to have soil to have food. And we're wasting it. In these areas, we've done a lot of things where we focus on soul practices. We focus on putting Band-Aids on where we're hemorrhaging. We focused on things like conservation agriculture. We focus on conservation agriculture looks at no-till. We focus on doing some managed grazing practices. We focus on doing some better crop breeding. We focus on doing these things. But when we focus on single practices, what we've done is we've taken the loss of our topsoil in the middle of our country, according to NRCS data, Natural Resources Conservation USDA data, we've taken the loss of our topsoil from the 1970s through the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and these conservation practices from losing 3 billion metric tons of topsoil every year down to about 2 billion metric tons of topsoil every year. Yay for us! I'm so proud! <laughs> really, I am. But we're still losing nearly 2 billion metric tons of topsoil every year. 2 billion with a B. With a B. Metric tons of topsoil in this country every year. In this country. We are a first world country that loses nearly 2 billion metric tons of topsoil. Yes? Is that just degradation or is that through it is, uh, it's a combination, it's, a, it's everything, but a lot of it is through the degradation that we have. It is through most of it because most of it's happening here, where a lot of it is our, along our cropland, where we lose it through our rivers, down our river, lakes and rivers and streams. And so what we need to do is we need to change things by doing a systems approach to things. And I talked a lot about a systems approach yesterday. So we're not going to focus so much on a systems approach, but we're going to focus a lot on this roadmap and why it's important. And why this has become important to me is mostly because of these two people and one little person who's not here yet. 
But this is my grandniece, and this is my younger sister. And I have a grandnephew who's on the way, so he's not the person who's here yet. Um, but my grandniece is her life expectancy is less than mine. My grandnephew's life expectancy is less than hers. We are a first world country, but for the first time in our history, our life expectancy is going down rather than up. We are a first world country that suffers from malnutrition and obesity at the same time. We've heard a lot about health and nutrition at this conference, which is a really good thing, and it's a very understandable thing, and it's a very important thing to be talking about. But it also is a thing that has to help us to get on a roadmap on being able to move things forward. And if it isn't just about the food we eat, for these two little people, that are helpless and can't do anything about it, it also is a concern because this, the Holland well field, this is not an oil well, this is a water well field. This provides drinking water for 65,000 people in rural Minnesota where they live. They had to close that well field and are looking for finding a new place to get drinking water for these people because that well field is contaminated, was contaminated with nitrates. This is not a problem that we exported down the Missouri and Mississippi rivers to the Gulf of Mexico. This is a problem for these people. They can't do anything about it. This is us. So there's a lot of reasons why. We all have our reasons why we need to do this. And who do we need to do this about? It's great to be here in the Northeast. And it's great to be thinking about the people that are here in the Northeast and what it is that we can do in looking at the population centers on the coast and thinking about the farmers that we have here. Because farmers have to be the people that we focus on, the farmers and the ranchers. And the farmers and the ranchers are doing all of these different jobs. This is what farmers and ranchers have to be now. They have to be plant pathologists, hydrologists, microbiologists, nutritionists, animal scientists, ecologists, economists, salesmen, engineers, mechanics, chemists, climatologists, plant breeders, animal breeders, animal nutritionists. All of these things and more in order to try and survive. And they're doing that not just on the coast, but in the middle of the country. When we're talking about the land and what we need to be focusing on, there's about 900 million acres of agricultural land in the United States. Roughly about 350 million acres is in cropland, row cropland. About 400 million acres is in pasture production. Of that, we have 27 million acres in row crop production on the East Coast, 19 million acres in pasture on the East Coast, 22 million and 55, 58 million on the West Coast. The majority of what we're talking about is here in flyover country. The majority of what we're talking about is not where there are people. It's not where there are the consumers and the customers that are going to be making the choices for these people. There's a reason why these people are growing low quality feed in an industrial product. because they don't have a choice. I grew up there. I live there. I have family there. I know many people who live there and come from there. It's not that they have a choice. It's not that that's what they want to do. They're all just as passionate about the land. They all love the land. They all would like to do something different. They'd grow anything. 
But we've set up a system in which is the, this is the choice that they have. And part of rebuilding a roadmap is that we need to figure out to create a different destination that the destination that we want, that abundant, inexpensive, nutrient-dense, easily accessible, environmentally friendly, economic food source, in order to be able to create that, we need to give them other options. Right now, we can get that. But we get that by importing it from overseas. The food industry can solve that problem for us. It's a little bit difficult to make sure that it's entirely environmentally friendly. And it depends on how you want to call it economically good. It depends on how you look at the economics of things. Who's getting paid? If you want the farmers to get paid, if you care about slave labor or other things like that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of economic things that need to be tweaked here. But overall, you could say that, that, you know, the food industry can solve this issue. And I'm not going to, I'm not trying to point fingers or, or make blame. This is not what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. I'm not trying to lay out things and say, we have to go and point fingers at somebody and say, you're a bad guy, and you're a bad guy, and you're a bad guy, and you're a multinational, and you have to get out of here, and you have to get out of here, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do this. And this, is, this is us. So part of what I want you to be thinking about is how do we look, as we're looking at mapping these things out, again, this is a lot about thinking about the various types of obstacles and the complexities of this. Because it isn't just an easy enough thing to say, I'm no longer going to buy from Walmart. Because there's nothing else in the middle of the country but Walmart. So you put Walmart out of business, And there's a lot of people who have to then figure out a way to drive 150 miles to get food, which is not an easy thing. Especially if you may be a migrant family or an immigrant family who's now working in a meat processing family in a meat processing facility in the middle of Kansas. We have to think about everything that we do because our choices that we make and the decisions that we make don't just affect one thing. It's all downstream issues. It's all interrelated. The fungus I fell in love with is a mycorrhizal fungi and the mycorrhizal web is interwoven into everything. And what this has taught me is everything is interwoven here. So how we achieve this destination <laughs> is figuring out this is a paradigm shift that has to happen through everything. It isn't just easy enough to just say, this has got to go away. It isn't just easy enough to just say, well, we're just going to change it here, and we'll be OK. This has got to be changed all over the place in a different way. So we have to be looking at how we're going to change the whole entire system. And part of changing the whole entire system is also approaching on-ramps differently, letting people come into the system in different ways. I work with farmers that are conventional farmers. And conventional farmers are not bad farmers. I work with farmers that will never, ever, in their lifetimes, use the word organic. And I respect them for that. And the reason is, is because for them, they will never, ever 
be able to market anything that has an organic label on it. You can't just say that things have to be organic. You can't just say that it has to be this way. We can't let words and terminologies and phrasing divide us and set up these barriers and say that, again, this is a bad person or this is a bad thing. Because if we do, we're not going to succeed. And again, we have to change hundreds of millions, billions of acres now. And if we want to do it now, we have to do it in a way in which we don't let things get in our way and divide us. If you want to get in my way and say that I'm wrong, get out of my way. Or tell me where I'm wrong and help me figure out how to fix it. But don't just stand there and say I'm wrong and be angry. Because we've got issues with water. And this isn't just about climate for climate's sake and carbon credits. I talk to farmers all over the country. And when I talk to farmers, when I first went to North Dakota, so Dan asked, talked to me about coming and speaking at this conference and, uh, several months ago. And when we first started talking about it, and, then, and I was uh, recently, I had left my position at the Rodale Institute, and I was trying to figure out a roadmap for myself. And so in trying to figure out where I was going and what it was that I was going to do and who I was going to be, in all of those evaluations that I was going through and discussion I was having with Dan on the phone, I said, you know, really, I, I feel like there's this sense of urgency. And this was one of the reasons why I, I left my position, is I felt like there was this sense of urgency. And I felt like there was this division, division that was happening. And I needed to get something going that was a little bit different. And it all kind of also came back to this fact that when I had first, as, as a woman, in agriculture and agricultural sciences, and moving to North Dakota as a young woman in agriculture and agricultural sciences. Again, I grew up in the Midwest, been in farming all of my life. But then now you are a scientist and a woman scientist in agriculture. And you go and you talk to farmers. And you're talking to farmers not about how you're going to be their hero and you have this marvelous new chemical or this marvelous new seed that's going to solve all of their problems. You want them to actually change their whole farming practice to focus on a fungus that's not a fungus that you want to kill, but a fungus that you want to thrive. This is not going to go over well. So you have to be very careful about how you talk and what it is that you say. And I was very concerned about many things that I would say and how the language that I would use. And you wouldn't want to say things like climate change and carbon credits and those types of things. But what it taught me is, again, in thinking about this, is that isn't the point. The point with everything is not about climate change and carbon credits. The point is, is how do I make a living? How do I manage the system? And if I talk to them about growing organic matter and creating a system in which they can thrive with reducing some of their costs, and being able to manage a system better in which we can manage water better, those were things that would be something that they could understand and get involved in. What we do a lot of times is, again, we use language to divide us instead of using language to unite us and bring us together in a conversation. And so as we put things together in looking at what water can do or not do, so when we talk about climate, our climate issue as an on-ramp, 
Not that climate is a scary thing from there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere and greenhouse gases and we have to regulate this and you have to put all of these penalties on it. Everything that we do now in the way that we look at the world is from a negative standpoint. I consider myself to be, I've always considered myself to be an optimistic pessimist. I am incredibly optimistic about our potential. As a species, I'm a weird duck, if you haven't noticed this already. I'm a very odd duck. I take a very biological point of view to things. I look at things very from an evolutionary biological standpoint. Things follow these biological biochemical rules. So from a biological standpoint, this is, this is how you know, we are in things, that we have to follow these, these certain rules. And so in this, this process of things, Following these, these various types of rules, now I lost my train of thought. Where was I at? Somebody help me out. Pessimistic, optimistic pessimist. Yes, optimistic pessimist. So I'm optimistic about our potential because I think that as we've evolved the brain that we have, not that we use it all, but as we've evolved the brain that we have, we have, we are incredibly optimistic about our potential to utilize that brain and to get ourselves out of the things that we, our brain gets ourselves into. I'm incredibly pessimistic about our will to action, about us getting ourselves on a road. We don't like getting ourselves on a road. Now that we seem to be under a lot of pressure, there seems to be a lot of pessimism that's coming along. And I also must be a person who likes the underdog, which is probably why I like being with farmers. So <laughs> I love the underdog. And so in loving the underdog, now I'm like more optimistic than I think a lot of other people are. Because I think that we now have the chance. We have the incredible opportunity now to take that road, to be able to solve the issues that are existing. And the reason is, is because Necessity is often the mother of invention. It's a great phrase. But we don't have to wait until we're completely at the crisis point. Because we can see it and we know that it's there. And so we can utilize this idea that water is a crisis that we see coming down the road. That nutrition and health is a crisis that we see coming down the road that economics is a crisis that we see coming down the road. For some of us, those things have already hit and hit hard. But for a lot of us, it's still just right outside the edge. So we can see it there and we can utilize those things as on ramps to get on there and to get on this road before it's too late. Because we need to get on this road. Chris, can you give a syntax example of a pickle? How would you phrase that to say this is an unreal? So this is where we're gonna go. Okay. So water. Um, we've got some examples of water as, as some issues. So this is some water issues. We all know of some water issues that have been going on in California. We've all got some water issues for ourselves is some, some specific things. So this is some water issues from Kutztown, Pennsylvania, um, near the Rodell Institute. And the thing with water is, is water is an issue that is an issue that we have. And I talk about these things being issues because water is a manageable issue if we build up carbon in the soil. Water is not a problem. Water is an issue. And you can see why. In this case, both of these fields had the same amount of water. One performs better than the other. In this case, both of the fields had the same amount of water. One performs better than the other. 
In this case, the, the uncertainty of that is happening more frequently. In this case, again, this is an environment in, we had in which we have a 16, or 14 to 16 inch average rainfall. In this case, in 09, we had a rainstorm event which was like being in a tropical thunderstorm. We had essentially about 13.6 inches of rainfall in 24 hours. At one point in time, it was coming down about six inches an hour. Again, it was like being in a tropical rainstorm. It literally was. I mean, it was, it was amazing. This farmer, Gabe Brown, some of you may have heard him, some of you may know him, seen his ranch. This is his field the next day. Water can be an on-ramp because right now people are stressed with the lack of or too much water at different times. But it's an on-ramp because we can solve the water issue. Gabe has taken his soil has regenerated his soil so that when he started on his farm, his infiltration rate was about a half an inch an hour. He's now taken it up to eight inches an hour. If we improve the porosity of our soil just by 45%, what that is is the biogeochemistry, the organisms in our soil creating soil aggregates, utilizing the biogeochemistry, the fungus that I so love, helps to engineer its own habitat. It creates a structure in the soil. It builds a building in the soil. That structure that it creates, that aggregate, creates pore space between the aggregates. It creates open space between the buildings. That open space, if you improve that open space by 45%, you increase the infiltration rate of the first inch of, uh, of, the first inch of water by 167% and the second inch of water by 650%. It's going to rain more inches per hour and fewer times all across the country and all across the world. This is what we need to do. The on-ramp is how do we get this done? If we want to manage water, if water is our issue, as an on-ramp to regenerative agriculture, we need to show that we can manage water. If there's a drought in California, if you live in a drought prone area like California, I was in California in 09 and had a workshop there and I told the farmers and ranchers in California, I said, if you live in a drought prone area like California, the thing you need to do is plant more plants. It's the first thing you need to do, be planting more plants and grazing them. That's what you need to do. Several of them looked at me like I was high, but that's okay. Because we need to get more carbon in our soils and more biological activity, because we need to have more porosity. Because engineering is not gonna solve this problem. Cre trying to physically create Burns is not going to solve this problem. This is what we did in places like Iowa. We did terracing. It was a conservation ag practice. We created terraces. We still lose nearly 2 billion metric tons of topsoil, regardless of the fact that we did these things, because physical changes are not going to solve the problem. 
because we haven't identified what the true problem was. The true problem is, is that we don't have enough carbon in our soils. When we focus on the problem, we know where we start, we know who we need to focus on, we know what our destination is. We identify different ways in which we can use different on-ramps to get onto the road. So I'm on the road because I need to solve my water issue. This is what I'm going to do. I'm on the road because I need to provide more nutritious food to people because I have a consumer demand. This was an issue of a farmer magazine called Successful Farming. Why more farmers didn't listen to this, I have no idea. This was, in 20, this was a 2016 issue of Successful Farming. In this issue, the new boss is her. She wants more nutritious food. She doesn't understand what more nutritious food means. She has no idea what organic means versus non-GMO. In some cases, she thinks non-GMO is actually better than organic. Because the two words, she doesn't understand what that means. We live in a pretty uneducated populace. I was discussing with someone over lunch, listened to a, a book on tape, um, as I was driving up here, a book on tape by uh, Thomas Friedman, economist. And he said one of the, the most critical jobs in our country today is the Secretary of Education. Because we're stupid. He didn't say that, but you know, I filled in the blanks. <laughs> so she doesn't know what it is exactly that she wants. But she does know that she wants a healthy kid. She wants a calm kid, because we see things like ADHD increasing and those types of things. She wants a healthy kid. So she understands more about what she wants. So another on-ramp to this whole regenerative agriculture, to being able to get ourselves there, is to focus on producing healthier food is focus on satisfying this consumer demand. Because she is willing to pay 25% more for healthier food, for what she perceives as healthier food. Now the problem is, is as I said at the beginning, the food industry can tell her what healthier food is. And it doesn't have to come from the 900 million acres in the United States, or the acres in Canada. Because <laughs> they can get it cheaper and easier from someplace else and sell her the story that it's healthier food. Yes. But consumers can't and so imported is way cheaper and so like US farmers can't compete with the cost, cheaper cost of doing business. But I would argue that a little bit because consumers want more local. Yes and no. Consumers want right now, they want more local and they want the story of more local. Where is my phone? This thing will tell you any story you want. <laughs> to any consumer that they want to tell the story to. And again, you're looking at people on the coast. Granted, they're a higher percentage of population. But the people who we need to grow the food are the people in the middle of the country. 
And so we need to solve this problem in both ways. In the way that the people are being told the story and where they're getting the food from. Because if it's coming from the middle of the country, that's not local. And so if you're told that it's coming from 1,700 miles away in Iowa, or you're told that it's, being coming, it's coming from 5,000 miles away, it's still not local. You can still be told the same story. Walmart sells goods from the USA, made in the USA. They're not made in the USA. None of them are made in the USA. But they can stamp the label on there. <laughs> the games can be played. And it's an easy enough one to be done. The same thing goes, again, with how they can define healthier. And that's one of the things that many of the speakers at this conference have talked about. There's a difference between packing food with mineral nutrients and making those nutrients bioavailable. There's a difference in how we define nutrition in food. We took fat out of milk and added sugar. And we added sugar, and we didn't have to call it sugar, we called it a preservative. So we don't have to count it as sugar. We get away with this stuff. Yes? China and India are working on doing that right now. They are working on, through, through blockchain and cameras that they have set up, you can follow, as a consumer, you will be able to follow your food. As it's being grown, what it is, what's added to it, you can scan with your QR code, you can follow it through video cameras, and as a consumer, it will look to you, and, and, and how would you feel? You can either go to a store and buy something that you haven't seen the whole entire process of it being grown, or you could see something, or you could buy something off of the shelf. You're a consumer and you don't know. They are 10, 15 years ahead of us in putting this stuff in place. Yes. Yes. That organic versus, like non GMO, for instance, or uh, those terms, organic doesn't have a good connotation with a lot of farmers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because there's a lot of real crappy organic food, and I think basically it's, it's a matter of energy. We're, us as farmers, we're managers of energy. Yes. So the consumer is really asking us for, for food that has more energy because that's what they're going to get. The minerals are all energy. So if we don't talk about organic and just talk about getting the farmers to grow crops that have more photosynthesis, which gives more energy to the soil, which gives more energy to the plants and, and food in the end, that if we, if we convince them that that's what we're doing, we need you to grow more energy and have a way to measure it, like Dan's yep. little machine, that it will <coughs> resonate better with farmers, like conventional farmers that are, you're going to try and convince to grow good quality food, well, everybody has a different uh, description or, or definition of what's quality food, but it's really the energy that we're needing to get mm -hmm. through to the consumer. Right. So somehow we need to, we need yeah. to, we need to, we need to sell that message because that is the bottom line of things. Again, it can't be selling organic. In the end, it can't really be selling regenerative. It is about selling food. Farmers need to go back to feeling like they're growing food again and grow food again. And consumers need to go back to understanding that they're eating food. 
and what that really means. And again, food is about energy and energy flow from things and what it costs to produce food and what it costs to produce food and paying for the true cost of that. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, again, these are the issues that we're facing, and we have to recognize the reality of these issues that we're facing and figure out having these discussions. I don't have the answers for this, but having these discussions and making this part of the real discussion where we don't, again, use words to put us in silos that keep us apart. Because, again, She's willing to pay more, but she doesn't know what she wants. And she knows that she wants something that's more healthy, but she doesn't understand what more healthy means. And she doesn't understand, again, what the overall cost of getting something more healthy is. No, she doesn't, she doesn't know what the, she doesn't know, right. There is a perception. We do everything based off of a perception, and much of it is based off of perception that we receive from this. You have two seconds to tell her to choose this. And you're lucky if you have two seconds, because she's got that kid that we saw in her arms that you're lucky if you have two seconds of her attention to tell her. Yes. Right. Yep. So we need to figure out, again, this is, this is laying all of this out and figuring out how it is that we're going to approach working together to get this done. Because we do have an issue. And the other thing with her is this is also the other crisis point with this, is the average person, she, although she would like to spend more, and although she is willing to spend more, right now the average person spends 20 to 25% of their income on out-of-pocket healthcare costs. This is one of the biggest crises that is hitting us in the US. This doesn't affect Canada as much, but there are issues in Canada similarly related to this. The issue that exists here is if you pay 50% or a little bit more of your income to housing, 25, 20 to 25% of your income to health care, we used to spend close to 30% of our income on food. We now spend about 10% of our income on food. In the 50s and 60s, we spend about 30% of our income on food. We now spend 10% on food. We don't have, the average person doesn't have any more money. Think about it. 20 to 25% on health care, 10% on food, 50% on housing, you have about 15% that's disposable on everything else you have to do in life. There's no more money. Most people, for, for, and I'm talking about the average person income for, for, for an average person's, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. If you look at, at, so the average person's income, looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics values, 
if you're looking at their, their average person's income, what housing costs have gone up for, for rent, those types of things. So if you're looking at housing, for a, a housing cost, if they own a home, it's different. But for rent costs, it's gone up for rental income. Yes. Yes. Well, and right, and there again, we have to connect things to to health and to the potential reduction in health, but their health care costs. But as long as this stays where it's at, if out of pocket health care costs, if just and this is just out of pocket, this is just for you know prescription drugs, going to the doctor, uh, copays, those types of things. If that stays where it's at, that average person is not going to be able to do this. There, there, there is no way that that average person is going to be able to pay more for food. We're, we're stuck right now. And that's, that's part of this. Again, there, there's, there, we're, we're right now at a point where there is nothing that we can do with that because the average person can't pay more for food. Yes. Right. We heard, uh, I'll share with you real quick, right. Martin Anderson, we heard him speak years ago. He said, combine your health care costs plus your food costs as one budget item. Right. Better food, lower health care costs, you save money, you win, you're happy. Right. Good concept. How do we get that message out to folks more effectively? Right. And, and again, right now, the only way that we can do that, and, and this is where we need to work on one of the ways in which we're going to get out of this in, in the U.S. is we need to have a single payer system. Because, because, because that has to go away. We, can't, we cannot afford, the, the average person cannot afford to continue to pay that. The country cannot afford to pay that. Is 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 Well, here's here's the deal. If you don't do that, you end up in 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 where I'm at in, in flyover country with farmers that have no insurance. That's a different story. Yes, farmers who have no insurance who basically, because, because there is no insurance program for farmers, there is no insurance program for farmers, they end up not being insured. They don't pay that much for out-of-pocket health care costs, but there are no hospitals anymore. Hospitals are closing all over the Midwest. There is no health care program for them anymore. There is no infrastructure for that anymore. So now you're losing a lot of the healthcare industry and a lot of the infrastructure across the Midwest. Okay. That is and, and, and so a single payer system would solve that because then you would be able to retain the hospitals in the Midwest. Because you wouldn't be able to keep the hospitals in the Midwest because the, 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 because the farmers don't have insurance, they don't pay to go to the doctor. They only pay if something happens to them, which at this point requires them. I live in a town of, my family lives in a town of 700. 
the nearest major hospital is nearly 200 miles away. If something happens, there's a couple of clinics that are closer by. But if something happens, you've got to go 200 miles. This is not an uncommon thing. We have, and I totally, and, and, I, and, I, and I totally understand why this is language that's dividing us, but this is one on-ramp. I'm saying that there are multiple on-ramps. This doesn't have to be the only way to get there. This is one way to get there. Water can, people can disagree about what I'm saying about how to manage water. You can go out there and irrigate and do all those other things too. It, it, there are multiple ways in which we can get there. Not every way is the right way or the way that, that everybody's going to use. But if you want people to pay more for food, the average person cannot afford to pay more for food. I don't care if you, they do care about health now. And they're starting to understand. Again, I go, I go back, and I don't want to make it totally personal, but because I come from an area in the middle of the country with very few people, my daughter or my sister and brother-in-law own a grocery store in a town of 700 that they're having to close now um, because they can't keep it open. Um, my niece, who is having a, my grandnephew, she doesn't necessarily buy the best food for herself, but she makes choices for her children. Um, because she cares about the food that she's feeding her kids. So these are the things that these people are choosing to do. And I see this happening. And I talk to the people that are there. And I see this happening with these people that are there. So I know that this is occurring. But again, in talking with them, this is not something that they can afford to do. When your income is $35,000 a year, your food choices are limited. That's what we're talking about, is an income of $35,000 a year. That's the average income for these people. After tax income is $35,000. Isn't part of the problem that the government says that the Walmart food is healthy? It, not necessarily. I mean, some of it, it, it is, again, it's, it's, one of it is access. So some of it is access, but it isn't always just the messaging that you get. I mean, yes, nutritionists in schools are, are you know, the, the basic messaging. Yes, the basic messaging is, is, is all wrong. Education does need to change. Again, the, the best job should be the Secretary of, or the Secretary of Education because, there's a lot that we need to do about educating our populace. But I think the greatest impetus for us, like we're, we're grass-fed beef, and uh, we do the soil inputs and everything. We have, sick, we have doctors sending people to buy our beef. Yes. Because that's how you're going to get healthy. Yes. And it, it's not until, and we went into it for a, a traumatic health crisis in our family. Yes. And it's not until you, someone personally feels it, unfortunately, yeah. that they want, they demand demand right. the better food, yep. and they'll forego this and they'll forego that. Right. But I, I think you know, you've know you got people saying, this food is fine. Right. It's, and you've got the government saying this food is fine. And yep. it's personal health crises that are sending people yep. this way or yep. knowing someone. Right. And how do we get beyond that? Right. And that's, and that's part that's, of this, that's, is, that, is how do we get beyond that? And Again, this isn't the whole way to get beyond that. But in one of the ways of, again, trying to get people to buy healthier food, if we want to get hundreds of millions of acres, we have to get the average person who makes 35000 a year to buy better food. If we want them to buy better food, they have to have more disposable income. Somehow, something's got, push has got to come to shove. Something's got to cost them less. One of the things that can cost them less is health insurance. 
One of the things that can cost them less is housing, possibly. One of the things that could have, despite the desire, it's just like saying farmers are to blame. There are a lot of consumers out there that, despite their best wishes to want to buy healthy food, they just can't do it. And there are a lot of consumers out there, I worked with a lot of consumers that, um, low, from low-income families that made a lot of choices on buying healthy food, again, for their kids and what they would buy for themselves made you sad. But they made the choices for their children, which is a good thing. But these are the choices that people have to make. And that's, that's where we are. So we have to look at all of these things. It isn't just an easy thing of just saying, again, these people have to make these choices. How can we redesign a system so that people have the options to do this? And you're right, this is part of it. This is out of 100, 2005 to 2014. We're just barely, a 50, uh, just barely above 50 out of 100 on our healthy choices as an average in the United States. This is, our, this is our healthy eating diet. This is our choices. This is our selection. So it goes back to what we're choosing. We don't make the best choices. Again, we're a first world country in which we suffer from obesity and malnutrition. We're not good choosers. We also know, as we've heard multiple times at this conference, that we've got a decline in nutrient density in our food. A lot of this, again, is because of the way that we've chosen to grow our food. I shouldn't say because of the way we've chosen. Because of the way in which we've had to grow our food. Because we've focused solely on growing more food, because we've said that we need to feed the world, because we focus on yield, a plant physiologically, when it is bred or required to produce more grain or bigger grain or bigger fruit or more fruit or bigger leaves, what it will do physiologically is it will put into that the resource that it has in the most abundance. The plant resource that it has in the most abundance is sugar because that's what it makes via photosynthesis. Sugar is what it will put into that. Whether it's polymerized sugar in a carbohydrate form or straight sugar, it doesn't really matter. It's still sugar. It will put sugar into that tissue. It will create more sugars in there, which has created, in some cases, what they've referred to more as a dilution effect. But the other thing that happens with the plant on a physiological basis when that demand occurs is normally in the soil, what we want is we want the plant to allocate sugars and resources, carbohydrates, and carbon below ground to feed the soil microbiology, to feed the fungi and the bacteria. What ends up happening is that when the plant is bred and selected for higher yielding and the demand is to put that above ground, there is less to allocate below ground. We see this physiologically in our plants in the fact that they are not creating the same root architecture that they used to. They don't make the same amount of root mass that they used to. Many of our crop plants are more susceptible to lodging. They fall over more readily because they're not creating the root mass that they used to. Because again, they're allocating more resources above ground rather than below ground. 
When we've done that, that change has reduced the activity of the biology in the soil. When there's less activity of the biology in the soil, there's less cycling and breaking down of various amounts of organic matter and minerals in the soil to release micronutrients and make them available to the plant. So the plant has less micronutrients. There is also less formation of antioxidants and polyphenolics on the part of soil microorganisms. Antioxidants, amino acids, and polyphenolics. Some of them are things that the only way in which they get into human beings is through microorganisms. One of which, I'm going to skip over this because one of which I want to talk about is from mushrooms. There is a substance called ergothionine. Some research going on at Penn State University um, looking at ergothionine. Ergothionine is an antioxidant. The only way in which ergothionine gets into our food, if we don't consume mushrooms directly, it can get into our grains. It also can be found in animals that consume grains and get into our food by eating those animals is if those fungi are allowed to thrive in the ecosystem. How we manage our crop production appears in preliminary research to have an impact on the production of ergothionine. Ergothionine is an antioxidant that has relationship with various diseases related to aging, things like Alzheimer's. It also has potential to help as helping people resist cancer as an antioxidant. Other types of, of diseases, and inflammatory diseases. So we can change the quality of our food by changing the way that the plants allocate resources. But when we have selected for the highest yielding, the plants are selecting for the things above ground and not below ground. How do we change that system and still feed the world? and feed ourselves. So we've got all of these obstacles that are in the way of trying to change our system. We're looking at a system in which we've got the production needs on the part of the farmer. This can't be done. I need to have a certain amount of inputs. I need to have this type of a system design. I need to have these things. I can't just have a regenerative system. We need to have this amount of food. This can't be done. One of the biggest obstacles that I see to regenerative agriculture is infrastructure. And this goes back to the middle of the country. Canadians have a little bit of a leg up on this, and you guys need to take advantage of this and take advantage of it well. Infrastructure in the United States, we have an issue in the middle of the country in the fact that our infrastructure is designed primarily around growing corn, soybean, in most of the um, corn belt, the Midwest, in the Great Plains around growing wheat, and in the uh, South and growing wheat and cotton. The infrastructure is designed, what I mean by that is elevators, Rail cars are designed around shipping those commodities. If you want to grow something different, you got to figure out how to get a semi truck on the road to truck it somewhere. If you want to figure out how to be able to have a lot of animals that are grass fed and get them slaughtered, you got to figure out somewhere to take them <laughs> to get them processed because the average slaughterhouse is not going to take them. How is that going to get done? 
where are we going to take this? We're talking about hundreds of millions of acres. How are we going to do this? ADM, Cargill, and ConAgra have 15 to 20 year contracts with pretty much every elevator and railroad spur across the country on shipping these commodities. They have to change their minds on what they're shipping. Because right now, they've got contracts to ship low quality feed and industrial products. We don't have enough semi-trucks, truckers, and infrastructure on the road to ship the grains that we could grow on 100 million acres, much less 300 million acres in the middle of the country. It doesn't exist. But we have the opportunity, again, I'm not saying that ADM and Cargill and ConAgra are the evil people here. We just have the opportunity to discuss on how we can change this. We have the opportunity to discuss on how we can change the it can't be done idea. It can't be done because we need to have these inputs. This shows, this is a study that was done by um, Tillman in 2002. And basically, the top graph here is overall global cereal production. This bottom graph is a nitrogen use efficiency curve for cereal production. Overall, we have known, although this study is from 2011, we have known since about the 1920s, since we first started using synthetic fertilizers, that synthetic fertilizer use efficiencies are 50% or less. Nitrogen use efficiency since nitrogen fertilizer was first developed when we went away from utilizing manure and went to utilizing synthetic nitrogen fertilizer was 50%. I've always known that. Essentially what that means is 50% of the fertilizer that's applied ends up in the plant. That's it. Phosphorus is even worse. 30% of the phosphorus fertilizer that's applied ends up in the plant. Those numbers have been going down rather than up. Even though we have had breeding programs and management programs and mechanical programs that have improved placement and phosphorus placement and, and nutrient placement, and we've had all of these different types of management programs in place, efficiency has gone down. And the reason was, was because this number of 50% to start off with in the 1920s and 1940s when these studies were done was probably incorrect. It probably wasn't that high initially. It was offset by what was obtained from the soil. When the soil microbiology declined over time, the efficiencies went down because the soil wasn't there to fill in the blanks. So it can't be done because a regenerative system says, you were telling me not to apply as much fertilizer and I'm gonna mine the soil and so I'm gonna lose all of the fertilizer. I need to continue to apply fertilizer to this system. And I tell you as a farmer, I'm gonna tell Mel as a farmer that he needs to cut back on his synthetic fertilizer use and he's gonna tell me it can't be done. He's gonna mine his soil. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta play the game here with me, Mel. <laughs> He's gonna tell me that it can't be done, and I'm gonna tell him that it's already being done. He just didn't know it. <laughs> exactly, wasting your money. 
everything is about who pays and how much that person is paying for it. The biology is footing the bill here. And the person, the thing that's paying for it is the plant from photosynthesis. Wouldn't you rather have that happening than you having to write a check to somebody? Now granted, there may be a little bit of a cost in this in some cases, in some years, sometimes. There may be a little bit of cost in this in yield, but that's going to be a far less cost than you're going to have over time with the cost that you'd be writing. As we reduce the costs to the farmer, the farmer can make more on what it is that the farmer is selling. So again, what we need to sell to the consumer, although we can sell the consumer something at a little bit more, the consumer needs to be paying more for food because we do need to pay for the true cost of food. We have a cheap food policy in this country because we don't pay for the true cost of food. But paying for the true cost of food doesn't mean that there needs to be a premium added on to that. It's the true cost of food. If we were actually able to reduce the cost of food production because we're going to actually do the true cost of food production and eliminate the environmental cost of food production, now we can have the true cost of food, which the consumer may be able to pay, even though the consumer may have to pay for health care insurance. Doesn't have to always be the same. The on-ramp doesn't have to be this or that. There are a lot of different choices in the ways that the on-ramps can work to get this system to work. It's figuring out different paths within the economics to make the different choices work. Can't be done because I don't have enough in my soil. I don't have it there. SNRT. Not all of you may be familiar with SNRT. SNRT is something that I'm wildly familiar with. I don't know, you're familiar with SNRT? Do you have SNRT? You guys don't call it SNRT in Alberta, huh? SNRT is a combination of snow and dirt. Sorry, snow and dirt. Dirt is soil that is no longer soil. It has come off, it's blown off of the soil, off of the field, and landed in the ditch. This is snurt. <laughs> yeah, well, it's basically because of tillage. They did fall tillage. So this blew off because it didn't have any cover on it. So it blew off and it landed in the ditch. This is a farmer near where my dad farms in Canby, Minnesota. So I'm proud of this. This is my hometown area. It's great. So I had to drive by and take a picture of snurt. Grew up with snurt. Now, the snurt stuff that's here, we call it dirt. It's no longer soil. As a soil scientist, I know the difference between dirt and soil. <laughs> soil is organic. It's living. It can support life. Dirt is dirt. It's the stuff your mother yells at you about. It's the stuff that doesn't support life. It, doesn't li it isn't living, it's not organic, it doesn't have any good to it anymore, except for the fact that it does have nutrients in it. So a friend of mine, this was in Pennsylvania, Steve Groff, friend of mine, he had snurt, because we were having a snurt discussion over Twitter one day, and so Steve Groff went out there and picked up some snurt from Pennsylvania and he sent it in for a nutrient analysis. <laughs> so it can't be done, Mel, because there's no nutrients in our soils. <laughs> but Steve's got so much nutrients in his soils that he can export it in his snurt. <laughs> We have to recognize the value of soil before soil becomes dirt and we lose it all down the river 
when the snurt melts. <laughs> we want to have these systems work and function. And there are many ways in which they can. But we can't limit ourselves and tell ourselves that we're limited. Because if we do, we're going to end up in this problem. Again, infrastructure. The elevators that are there and the control that they have. We have to figure out how it is that this place doesn't just take corn and beans. This again is from Minnesota. This should take wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, chestnuts, hazelnuts. It should take, yes, A, pretty much anything that you want could be shipped out of this place. It's 90 miles from Minneapolis. Could go on rail to Minneapolis. If it's a few smaller commodities, it could go in truck to Minneapolis, get put on a barge and go anywhere. Not a problem. But this place, takes corn and beans. That's it. And every farmer around there has to grow corn and beans. Because their only other choice is to try and find somebody who will haul from their farm multiple semi-loads 90 miles to Minneapolis. Not just one semi load. We're probably talking, you know, on a small farm, not a very big farm, but, you know, looking at what, 20, 25 semi loads are going to have to come off of there? It's not going to work. Because that trucker is too busy doing short runs from the farms around there to the elevator. It's not going to work. The problem is not so much who owns the elevator, it's who owns the rail, the, the rail cars and the spurs to get to the elevator. Okay. And that's ADM, Cargo, and ConAgra. Um, that's, that's the greater issue is, um, in some cases it's a little bit of who owns the elevator, but in most cases it's, it's more about the infrastructure and the shipping. Right. Yes. And there, again, there are options with that. <coughs> and that is, is, there are a lot of abandoned elevators. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of options with elevators to create the, recreate the infrastructure. And I've talked to a lot of food companies. I talked to big food companies like General Mills and Cargill and those types of companies. Um, I've, I've talked to other people as well about this because I think that that's a way to, to solve this. The, the other, again, the, Part of the issue, they can get the rail cars, but some of it is the spurs, because some of the spurs to that become a little bit of an issue on how you get the rail cars to the, to the particular elevator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there are some, some issues. There are some ways around it. And again, it's, it's not an impossible thing. 
And Cargill is in the process right now, they just hired someone and are in the process of hiring several other people on creating a regenerative ag program. So they're discussing this. So again, this is, and it's in response, one, to consumer demand. And it's consumer demand that is happening at the Walmart level. Because Walmart told General Mills and Kellogg's that they have to provide this stuff. And General Mills and Kellogg's told Cargill, which is where they buy most of their commodities from, that they have to supply it. So, again, consumers are making a change. It isn't that this isn't happening. It's just we have to look at where is it that we can look at support and creating ways in which I told a number of people a long time ago, I said, if you want to invest in something in, in, in the future, invest in buying some elevators in the middle of the country. <laughs> processing plants. And processing plants. And 